session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. Our next section is going to be talking about the Confederate Ireland, uh, some of the English history of James I, Charles I, Charles II, James II, William and Mary, and in the middle of it all, Oliver Cromwell. I think we have to say, uh, before we get to some of the others, what was going on in England and Ireland. Now, we have uh, James I of England was also James VI of Scotland. And he became the king after his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, died, and he became the king. But she was the cousin of Elizabeth, who's sitting on the English throne. And James the first godmother was Elizabeth. So you have the family still in squabble. There is rumor that Mary, Queen of Scots, was killed uh, by Elizabeth, but some say, yes, uh, she had her poisoned uh, others say they don't think she did, but because of the way uh, they thought that Elizabeth was actually very worried that there would be contenders to the throne because even when she got the throne uh, from her sister, half-sister Mary, there was still speculation as to who who was really to be in charge. And so the, the lords uh, of England, the parliament boys, they were really kind of pushing to make sure they stayed in power and they saw Elizabeth, who was no... Uh, a soft monarch, uh, but they wanted Elizabeth because they thought that would be something that would work very well. Uh, and under James, the golden age of Elizabeth with her literature and drama, that continued. And of course, it's the time of Shakespeare and Dune and Johnson and Sir Francis Bacon. Had a very strong literary uh, support there. So James, when we look at how did the Irish deal with it? James was actually very favorable towards Ireland. He let them go about in the way they wanted, uh, um, not seeing them particularly as a threat, as did his the previous monarch uh, in, uh, in England. And when James died, his son became the king, and that's Charles I. And uh, Charles uh, became king after his brother died, and so... Uh, he, uh, he believed as his father in the divine right of kings. So who was to be in charge and who do you deal with and uh, who do you permit? Yet he wanted to maintain what the, uh, the Church uh, of England was, and he is the head of it. Yet his wife was Catholic and her brother uh, happened to be the king of France. Her father had been the king of France. You have all of this... Uh, monarchies and who's related and who's marrying, and sometimes it becomes very confusing. Uh, but here's the Irish in the middle of it. And during the time that Charles I was having difficulties with the parliament in England, uh, having trouble with the Scots, uh, having trouble with the Irish, uh, the Irish saw this one more time as an opportunity. So there were risings in Ireland, and there's the great Irish Rebellion of 1641, and it was uh, oh, an attempted coup d'etat uh, by the Irish Catholic gentry, but then it kind of developed into violence between native Irish and English and Protestant settlers. Remember, Elizabeth, in the Protestant uh, ascendancy, she sent people to Ireland from Scotland to take over the land and to try to uh, uh, settle it to her own advantage. And this time it became known there as the Irish Confederate Wars. Uh, but the one that everybody remembers, of course, is the Rebellion of, of 41. And the rebellion broke out in October, several months of chaos. 
uh, and then the, up, the Irish upper classes, and the clergy then formed the Confederation, the Irish Catholic Confederation in the summer of 1642. And uh, it became a de facto government for the most of Ireland. And uh, it was to be located in Kilkenny. And there's a beautiful castle in Kilkenny right along the Grand Strip uh, by the river. And uh, so it, it became even known a little bit more as the Confederation of, of Kilkenny right in the city of Kilkenny. And the other Protestant enclaves, Ulster, Munster, Leinster, were held by armies loyal to the Royalists or Parliamentarians or some of the Scot during the wars. Um, the Irish Confederate Wars and a joint reliance in 1648 against the Rump Parliament. In England, there's a civil war against the king. It's between the Parliament and the king. Well, here again, as I said, this is a, somewhat of an advantage uh, that they're looking at. Now, some terrible things happened um, in any war, in anything. And there's a terrible story that says that uh, the Catholics were taking the Protestants and uh, they were just massacring them. It's even the story of where they put them in a village, put them all into one building and burned the building, and that they all died. There's stories of where uh, they took the Protestants, they stripped them of their clothes, and they threw them off the bridges. Uh, there's stories that they would take boats then and go into the water, and the people who were trying to save themselves by swimming to shore were hit with the oars and beat on the head until they sank into the water, and they would take the children and bash them and their heads against walls. It was just a, a terrible thing. Some of this as in any tragedy, in any war, maybe can, may have happened. But as time went on and as stories became, uh, you want to tell the story a little bit better, exaggerations grew. And this led to some other difficulties that we'll see in about six years from there. And that actually happened uh, on both sides. The Irish would tell these stories and maybe exaggerate a little bit of what the uh, invader had done, and it stirred the blood. And up there, that the rebellion you, rebellion you mentioned in Ulster, uh, the O'Neills and Maguire and O'Reilly, McMahon and O'Moore were the uh, primary actors when you get into the Irish family names and the great clans that were behind it. That's right. I mean, it's just kind of a back and forth thing. Uh, the, both sides did things. They, they were all people living on this land, and when you're confronted, some of it is a defense and some of it was an offense. But so we have the Confederate Catholic Association, which uh, decided to become the, uh, the Confederate government, but they never, and this is very interesting in the thought, they never claimed to be an independent government. And, you know, this reminds me as we come forth into the 19th century that there was a great move on what became known as home rule. Uh, they didn't know what, if we had said, if we were alive in the 1640s and said home rule, nobody would understand what you're talking about. Home rule, what do you mean? We have a king, we have a government. In fact, they were actually going to be loyal to Charles I. And uh, part of their, uh, part of their, um, their saying in Latin, Hiberne unanimis pro regio rege et patria, which meant Irishmen united for God, king, and country. So it kind of says, well, wait a minute, how come they're loyal? But they were loyal in a sense to Charles because they felt Charles wasn't so uh, anti-Catholic because his wife was Catholic, Henrietta Maria. She was Catholic, and they thought, wait a minute, Charles understands being Catholic. And as we'll see later on, uh, one of his sons, uh, James, was Catholic and tried to restore the church in England, but of course was then defeated. But uh, they wanted to have uh, uh, Catholicism as the state religion in Ireland, and they believed that um, Charles would let them happen. But because of the things that happened in 1641, Charles uh, had a great difficulty. He was horrified when he heard the stories. And uh, so then you had the Adventurers Act in 1642, which proposed confiscating all rebel lands in Ireland and a new policy of refusing pardon for any Irish rebels uh, who had been, uh, that had previously been agreed to. So, and then there was the idea they wanted an alliance with Spain or France. Those things failed. Well, you know that uh, that act for adventurers was very important because it actually promised 
two and one half million acres for Protestant investors. So these folks would come over and it wasn't just a war about religion or about the crown. This was about personal wealth of these adventurers who came over and they were promised this land. So you see this theme running out throughout the whole war. They came there for, uh, to increase their wealth and to obtain land and estates. And they weren't going to be put off because they were promised it, uh, uh, you know, quite quickly, readily, and in, in the open. So that led to debates throughout the rest of the century. Sure it did. And, and you know, uh, who's getting land? And they're the ones who stayed in England yet would own the land in Ireland. That became, uh, again, another uh, difficulty as time went on. We mentioned in the last uh, segment about uh, O'Neill, you O'Neill, and then we said, well, there was Owen Rowe O'Neill, who was also known as Red O'Neill. And uh, he had been in the Spanish army, and he comes to Ireland. Everybody knew him. They recognized him, and he was a great warrior. But there was jealousy. Imagine that. And it complicated things between Owen Rowe and the Catholic Confederation, which met in Kilkenny. Now, uh, Owen Rowe, O'Neill, and they're from what uh, part of the country there, Mike? Uh, that'd be the great kings of Ulster. Of Ulster, and, and in Donegal, when you said. And Owen Rowe was one of those who left on the flight of the earls. So he's coming back, uh, and uh, he decided, well, he was actually said that he was acting in the cause of Charles I. So he comes back almost saying, hey, I'm, I'm with the king. That's right. Uh, don't you find it strange if people today would realize how many of the Irish rallied behind the king in the 17th century, they might be set, really set on their heels. Exactly. And people don't realize that. But they say also that what he was doing is he really wanted, and this is uh, uh, Red Owen, he wanted Ireland complete independence, and he wanted it as a Roman Catholic country. So you've got the church thing is still in there, and the the uh, English, the independence idea is still there. And O'Neill wanted the plantation of Ulster overturned, and the recovery of the O'Neill's clan's ancestral lands. And so you have all that stuff. And an amazing thing about who's going to run things, who's going to be in charge. Uh, when we talk about the thing with France and Spain helping, the Confederates received oh, some subsidies from the monarchies in France and Spain. They're all they're somewhat related, of course. And uh, they wanted to recruit troops in Ireland, but their main support, main continental support, meaning the European continent, the main support came from the papacy. And uh, Pope Innocent X strongly supported this Confederate government in Ireland over, interestingly enough, the objections of the Queen Henrietta Maria, who is the wife of Charles I. Again, you didn't want to upset the family. You had a Catholic. There was a Catholic chapel in the king's mansion uh, or his castle, uh, and the, Henrietta would go to mass there while Charles went to his own chapel. I mean, that's how Charles was. I think he was. He was probably uh, saw things as they were, but yet he was the king and he was in charge. And so, but Rome, they did something very interesting. They sent a nuncio to Ireland. Now, a nuncio. Uh, the papal nuncio in Vatican history, that's the ambassador. But of course, imagine in these days when someone came from Rome as the spokesperson for the pope, that person was very important. Uh, there was the idea of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the divine right of kings, which Charles believed in, but remember that uh, divine right of kings, you who is the king of kings, and that's Christ, and who is the vicar of Christ, that's the pope. So you can believe anything you want, and if I'm the pope, I'm going to tell you thus why Henry had problems, thus why others had problems. It's kind of this, you have to understand the whole political and historical ideas that were going around in Europe at the time and some of the things of enlightenment. Now, Giovanni Battista Rioncini, who was the Archbishop of Fermo in Italy, embarked and came to Ireland. Uh, he actually thought that he should be in charge of this. Well, he was trying to uh, make sure that everything was still, people were being loyal to the Pope, to Rome, and in, in a time of great controversy, but with Charles having his trouble in England and Ireland not being converted to Anglicanism, even though with all the treachery that was going on and attempts, they still remained loyal. 
Would you say that the nuncio was, he was not in Ireland to obtain peace, but to obtain a greater role for the church in Ireland? Absolutely. And did, Absolutely. And you know, to add one other thing, just before we pass into the next phase here, the uh, if you take a look at the Scottish army, uh, when that bloody massacre happened that they thought was going on at, to a great degree up in Ulster, uh, the Scottish army came over to protect the settlers that had come in after the flight of the earls in the beginning of the century, that first decade there, uh, and shortly thereafter. And then the the role of the Scottish army is a little confusing, too, because as we'll see later, they actually ended up switching sides. But uh, let's go back to the Confederation now. Well, And also just remember with the Scots that... <laughs> England, Charles, wasn't too happy with them. He was actually having a war with them. And his problem with the Scots is they were Presbyterian. Oh, and that was a no-no so in his you regime. So all of this religious strife. Who's what? Who's in charge? Who, you know, who's on first? That kind of an idea. And uh, so when Charles was fighting the Scots, that wasn't doing very good. And they didn't like that. And that's when Charles had to ask Parliament to come back because he needed Parliament in order to raise money in order to fight the Scots. And in the midst of that comes our one of the people who was coming to Parliament who becomes a problem later. And how this Irish Confederacy, which lasted till 1649, coincides, its end coincides with Charles's end in England when Charles lost his head along with his crown. But when the nuncio came, uh, and this is in Ireland, he actually considered himself the head of the Confederate Catholic Party. And it's called, the, the you know, the, the Confederacy of Kilkenny, or the, but it's the Catholic Party in Ireland. And it and, seems that, that he and O'Neill, who came back from exile, were the, the hardliners in this uh, administration. They both took the hard line. They did not want to make peace. They wanted victory. Yes, they did. They wanted to do it all. It was, they felt the time was now. And then we have the Ormond Peace. Okay, so the Ormond Peace, which was uh, 1846, um, they decided March 28th or so uh, that they would uh, agree that in order to stop all of the fighting and under the terms, Catholics would be allowed to serve public office, found schools, which is also interesting. But uh, when we talk about the hedge school thing is that our schools, the hedge schools came about later uh, because they could do it, it back and forth, you know, into the next uh, a uh, hundred years, uh, but you could have schools. There were also promises for concession and religious toleration, which was something that the, the Irish were very, very concerned about. Uh, and there would also be amnesty for acts that to happened in the uh, rebellion or the rising of 1641, and no more seizing of Irish Catholic land. That's the other very important. You know, if, if you even think today how important land is to an Irishman, it, it's a precious thing. And, of course, I think they, <laughs> the English understood that. There was no uh, uh, reversal, though, of the, and this is a new thing that people don't know about, the Poynings Law, which basically said you can have a parliament all you want there in Dublin or in Kilkenny, and we're very happy for you, but anything you pass must then be presented to the English parliament, and so uh, don't think that you can have it just by yourself. And, uh, of course, there was no uh, reversal of the Protestant domination of the parliament. And uh, none on main uh, um, plantations or colonization, especially in Ulster and in Munster. And uh, the religious articles of the treaty, all churches taken over by Catholics in the war, had to be returned to the Protestants. And uh, anything, there was no guarantee that you could actually practice your Catholicism. There's no guarantee. So, as a result, this was not accepted uh, by the rest of the Confederacy, and so they said, well, it's, we can't do that. So then they say, well, then there was a, another battle, and there has to be another Ormond peace uh, because of the rejection, and uh, Ormond handed Dublin over to a parliamentary army, and uh, they tried to eliminate the parliament in Dublin and in Cork. But in 1647, they suffered a lot of military disasters, 
And uh, so that changed everything again. The setbacks uh, made most Confederates much more eager to come and reach an agreement with the Royalists, and then negotiations were reopened. So we have two two uh, peace agreements in the Ormond. And the Supreme Court became generous terms from Charles. Charles is still in the picture. What happened, too, it's a great thing that Charles, when he's in the midst of his civil war, and he says to the Irish, hey, I need to defeat these fellows in Parliament because I'm the king. He made an agreement with Rome that the Irish would send an army over to help Charles fight the parliamentary forces. That actually, as it comes down, is what got Charles ultimately beheaded. It was his giving in to those Catholics who the Parliament wanted the Anglican Church. They wanted, actually, and some of them wanted a Puritan Church. And so that changed a lot of things. Uh, And so by the end of that, in 1648, uh, all of that came to an end. Um, And you know, they say that it was the merchants that had land and the old English that favored the truce the most fervently. And then, of course, the folks that had nothing to gain from a truce, the, the people who had nothing, uh, they probably weren't quite so much in favor of it. Oh, no, they weren't. They weren't. So, but it's, it's such a complicated notion. And uh, everybody's fighting everybody, and all of the apparent disagreements kind of sounds like some of the things that happen today. Uh, the clergy was even split over what they should do. Uh, and, of course, this... Uh, with the ending of that and the difficulties that existed between England with Ireland, between the Anglican Church, the Protestant Church, the Presbyterian Church, the landowners, the, 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 those who claimed to be the earls and the lords, uh, it all came to a crashing uh, change when Oliver Cromwell decides to invade Ireland. And on those words, I think we'll bring this second segment of our 17th century uh, uh, story to an end. And uh, just remember to keep that uh, hedgerow growing. This is Michael Laughlin signing off. And this is Peter Adams wishing you all a wonderful day. So ends this chapter of Irish History from the Hedgerow. The entire series is available at www.irishroots.com. We have broadcast series on genealogy, song, local history, as well as original publications for every county in Ireland. The Hedge School in Ireland was totally reliant upon the local community to survive, just as we are here today in our modern-day Hedge School. If you believe in what we are doing for your community, please do something.